Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Terry. I'm the Sales and Marketing Director at Structured Communications. Um, and I, um, I joined the business back in June um, last year. So really interesting time to start um, a new career. I was um, 18 years in the aviation sector. So um, obviously, I'm sure we're all aware of the, the impact that COVID's had on that, that industry. And uh, so I took the plunge and uh, moved across to telecommunications. Um, so hence why I've got one of my colleagues, Matt, on the uh, on the call as well, just to help with any sort of technical challenges, because sometimes, obviously, as those that um, have been in the industry will know, it's uh, I think it's, it, there's even more acronyms in telecoms than there is in aviation and uh, travel. So um, still trying to get my head around those. But it's been a it's been a it's been an interesting sort of nine or eight months um, learning a new sector or trying to learn and. and um, yeah, I just uh, obviously with the throwing a pandemic as well and uh, the challenges of getting out and meeting clients, it's been uh, been fun, but it's been great and I'm I'm really enjoying it. So, and I think the the great thing with it is you get to work with um, partners like um, OpenReach. So Matt um, Dexter, who's going to be um, on the on this with me, uh, he's the head of client partnerships. So Matt, I don't know if you want to just say a few words. Yeah, yeah. Hi everybody. I'm um, really good to good to meet you all and thank you for this opportunity, Terry. Um, so yeah, Matt Dexter, I run um, head of client partner partnerships. What does that really mean? Is it run, I run customers for OpenReach and our customers are communication providers. And I'll go into a bit more detail as we crack on with that um, about you know how that kind of works and how it fits in for you as, um, as consumers or businesses. Um, so your house or your office. Um, I've uh, been around OpenReach and BT in itself for the last 20 years. Um, started off in the call centres in Gatwick, actually, or Three Bridges, actually, and then it moved to Gatwick, to City Place, before uh, dispersing off into London. Um, and I've done numerous different roles, but I find myself, luckily, looking after our communication providers, which obviously uh, Terry and Structured Communications are one. So that's me. Cool. Um do Sally, do would you normally go around the room? What's the sort of standard on this, or do, are we happy just to to move forward? We've got the titles, haven't we? On so it's, yeah, it's entirely up to you, Terry. It's your show, so. Um. Uh, yeah, why, why don't we? Um, do you guys want to just introduce yourselves? Um, I'll I'll do it from my screen, so it's a different format to you. So I've got Mark Sheeran um, on my screen first. Mark, you're on mute at the moment, Mark. Never seen your moment, first thing. Um, so hi, hi everybody. Um, yeah, my name's Mark. I, my company's called Maxwell Grant Consultancy and I work with businesses to basically review their costs and provide cost-effective solutions. And uh, I suppose I specialise in uh, telephony, you know, voice and data. So um, obviously very, very interested in, in hearing what you, uh, Terry and Matt have to say. Um, I, I, I only deal with businesses and uh, you know we all know how important connectivity is in terms of underpinning, um, uh, you know, a business's uh, business really in terms of their efficiency. You know, with all the cloud services now that that's there, um, I think I don't want to steal your thunder, but I think generally businesses uh, undervalue connectivity and how important it is. And uh, being very interesting to hear you guys, especially Matt, actually, in terms of the rollout of um, fiber to the premise, because obviously. Uh, with the switch off coming in 2025. Oh, um, you know your stuff then, Mark. <laughs> yeah, it's done homework. Have, Easy, yeah, Mark. Well, business, yeah, well, businesses have to. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I'm really pleased that Gatwick Diamond Business are um, promoting you, you two today. So that's right. it. Thank you. Um, Paul Evans. Hi everybody. I say Paul Evans. I'm Open Reach. I work for. Oh, Matt. of course. Sorry. Um, sorry. Um, and as you say, I'm support open reaches customers across the, the sort of the product set so uh, generally i'm at work more at the, the higher bandwidth end of the uh, the scale but i've uh, you say while working probably with matt off and on for most of his 20 years in bt <laughs> uh, i've covered pretty much every product at some point or other so yeah we try and uh, help uh, yeah, help explain to our customers what you know they sometimes customers will come through saying well this is what i'm trying to do which of your products can help me um and then you help people build a solution based on you know what they're trying to achieve and obviously the 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 
the products available from from OpenReach. Cool. Okay, great. Uh, Nick, next one. Hi all. Uh, next one, MD of Love Water. We're based at Gatwick, and we supply bottled and mains-fed water dispensers for uh, businesses and homes. That's my business. Um, Matt Warren, do you want to just uh, say hi? Yeah, hi everyone. Um, I'm Matt. I work with uh, Terry at Structured. Um, I'm part of the sales team as well. Uh, been there three and a half years now. Um, taken up a more of a partnership role lately, so looking after. Um, IT companies, AV companies, um, helping their clients with connectivity. Um, but yeah, I'm here to help Terry today if it gets a little bit technical, so hopefully it doesn't. Um, cool, got Jeff, Jeff Downs. Good morning, everybody. Um, my first house was in Pound Hill, by the way, and I was a regular at the Tavern on the Green, if that's still there, Sally, I don't know. Um, good pub, good pub. <laughs> great stories from there from a long time ago, but anyway. Um, yeah, so I'm the MD of Quantum Sales. We're a sales improvement consult consultancy. Uh, so that's my sort of mainstream role. And I work with companies, I work with individuals to help them with their sales effectiveness. Uh, that's my day job. Uh, also, I, was recent, I should mention this, Sally, shouldn't I? I was recently appointed as the chair of the GDB Executive Council. Um, that, that's not the, the main reason I'm here this morning because I'm a, a regular networker at events like this and I'm looking forward to this one. Cool. Um, Ian Woodland. Yeah, hi, everyone. I'm a director and um, co-owner of Assurity Consulting. Uh, we provide health, safety and environmental compliance uh, consultancy to um, large corporates and other large and significant organisations. Uh, but my role is as director of business services is to make sure that, uh, yeah, there's IT and looking after some of those issues phones, etc. And um, obviously, with the mix of working at home and working from the office that we currently have, I'm obviously interested to hear what uh, the future holds for us all. That's why I'm attending today. Great. Um, Eddie, Eddie Finch. Good morning, everybody. Eddie Finch from Chapter 3 Consulting. I um, run a compliance consultancy specialising in information security and ISO 27001. So, um, I'm very interested to see the impact of the new technology on businesses. I also work as a growth champion for Coastal Capital. So I work with a wide range of companies, of various sizes, and um, I'm an easy sell on technology. I got excited. I used to be in the telecom sector years ago, and I got excited when I got a um, high speed circuit switch data card that gave me 28.8 kilobits per second um, data <laughs> transmission. So if you can beat that, then I'm, I'm in. <laughs> Hopefully. Um... Cool. Okay, um, David. Hi. Hi, David Nolder. Um, so I work with a company called Auditel, um, and I, I basically um, help companies uh, anywhere between sort of five and, and 150 million, that kind of range, um, um, uh, generate cash for the future. Um, so, so what that means is from a, a, an area of procurement, from cost saving management, um, but also uh, from, from actually structuring uh, the different um, indirect costs uh, and working with suppliers help companies um, become more more efficient uh, in, in in that area. So um, very interested in, in telecoms. I used to be a, uh, a professional uh, um, services director or VP. So I used to um, run um, uh, financial technology uh, and, and predominantly sort of treasury uh, systems. Um, so so telecoms isn't an area I have great knowledge uh, uh, within, but. Um, interested uh, as part of my current business. Brilliant. Um, Francis? Oh, hi. Um, sorry, I was a little late to the uh, thing. I did a bit of an overlapping call. Um, I think I can beat the low-tech um, challenge there, by the way. Um, in the <laughs> 80s, I was using a BBC microcomputer with a pressed LED adapter at 9.6K, which is about the speed of a fax machine to order electronics from RS components. So I think I've got the, got the low-tech down. Um, I'm currently the... Um, Sales and Marketing Director for a company called ILG, International Logistics Group. We're an online e-commerce uh, fulfillment and delivery company, which as you can imagine at the moment, with all of the uh, physical stores closed, everyone ordering online, we're very busy. Good stuff. Um, who have I got left? I've got Hannah, I think Hannah's just joined. Hannah. 
Hi, Terry. How are you? Yeah, good, you? Yeah, very well, thank you. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Hannah I'm from First Recruitment Services. Um, we're a local uh, independent agency in, in the southeast. Um, I know Terry from, and Matt, sorry, from these, uh, these networking meetings. So, um, yeah, just interested to hear, hear what happens next, really, in regards to things like this and connectivity. Okay, cool. Um, I've got, and last couple, I've got Paul Matthews. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm Paul. I work for a company called Comtel. Um, who we're based in Manor Royal in Crawley. Uh, we manufacture intercom systems, which use uh, 4G network and also landlines uh, to make calls. Um, so, yeah, we're just kind of here to, as we know, landlines are getting switched off soon. Uh, just keen to know what technology and changes are coming next and the future of the network, basically. Cool. And last but not least, we've got Angela. I think she typed something in the chat because she's listening, but she's um, uh, okay. can't talk back. Cool. Okay, I can't see that with my screen, but no problems. And then obviously you've got Sally, a lovely host, and Gatwick Diamond. Good. Okay. Cool. Well, thanks for that. Um, so we'll get cracking. So the the um, what we're going to do? So me and Matt are going to just have a bit of a a, a conversation, really. So I'm going to ask some Matt some some questions. So I think. Coming into the industry myself, um, not really knowing too much about OpenReach. Um, so Matt, OpenReach, it's just B, it's BT, isn't it? Tell me a bit more. <laughs> um, BT Group do have ultimate ownership of OpenReach. However, we are a very separate, different business to, to BT. Um, BT in the different formats. So they have a global division, they have a consumers division, sport division a um a business they call it enterprise division you've got the local business um guys who'll be out selling which i'm sure you're aware of um they're all customers of open reach just like talk talk would be or of course structured communications are and open reach have about 600 um different customers selling all of our portfolio different parts of our portfolio and each customer by open reach is treated exactly the same so every customer has access to buy any of our products um, and they are, are they're sold at either regulated, so that means that Ofcom tell us what to charge, or equivalent price points, so that means that what I sell to BT, I have to sell at the same price to structured communications or talk, talk or cocktail. Um, the, the kind of model you see here is kind of how it works, is that from our 600 customers in both the consumer and business markets, um, if I refer to CP in this, apologies, that's kind of what we call our customers, communication providers. Um, so a CP would create their IT service or solution for you, which would run over our network or that of, a, say, a Virgin Media if you're buying a services through Virgin. So same kind of thing is that the CP would generate the, the content. It would run over OpenReach's network. And then that delivers you effectively the telephone line, the broadband connection, the storage or security that you require to run your business today. In its simplest terms, that's kind of how the open reach and supply relationship works. Um, the next slide, there's a few stats on here and don't worry, I'm not going to read through all of them. But um, if Terry, you could flick on what? Yeah, I just need to uh, slap myself on the wrist. I just need to let you know that this session is being recorded. So if any of you aren't comfortable with that, then uh, just uh, either let, leave the session or let us know. Um, and also, if you've got any questions, please either type them in the, the comments or we'll have a session at the end. We'll just go over any questions. But yeah, I'll move on, Matt. I feel like your glorified slide mover. Like in the couple, <laughs> couple of Next slide. So, so here you've got some big headlines on what is open reach and, and, and what we've invested in our network um, in, in 2021. So, for, so this year we will have invested two billion pounds in, in enhancing our fiber, generally our fiber to the premise network, but making sure our copper network doesn't drop off at the same time. We've got circa 35,000 people of which the majority are engineers out there working um, and an all, a vast number of vans. Um, <laughs> and we're continuing to recruit. Um, there are 31.8 million premises across the UK which have access to our portfolio. Um, obviously, there you can see that the, you know, the majority of which have access to 24 megabit or more. 
in terms of um, speeds and everybody is able to buy a, an ethernet connection that's a least line, least line high you know high bandwidth product um, in terms of how much work do we do well you can see it there that we do 9.9 .9 million jobs a year so that would be an installation of your telephone line or the fix of your fiber connection um, and then some numbers on the scale of our current rollout which i'll go into a little bit more deeper as we go through this presentation so, um, um, okay so matt do you want to go into a bit more detail on the network yeah yeah this is so if you want to flick on mate the, this is a top level view um so those of you who understand telco you're going to know a lot more than i'm going to describe here but what i want to do is give you a kind of a uh, a basic view of how the network works today, how it works tomorrow, um, and how you know how, what could happen in the future effectively. So, simplest way of thinking about OpenReach's portfolio is looking at it either as a copper delivery or a fiber delivery. So, uh, across our overall whole network, we have five and a half thousand exchanges. Um, this means, if you like, we have five and a half thousand mini data centers, and you'll find one of these in every village every town and city across the UK. In Crawley, there's, there's about three. Um, there's one in Hawley, one in Crawley, one in, I don't know, Paul, you might be able to help me on this one, but there's a um, Pound Hill, I think there is a one. Um, and in these data centers, effectively, all of our portfolio is driven. It's a, where all of our data is stored. Um, and these sites are central to how telecommunications work and how I can speak and we can have this call over Zoom today. Because without these without these exchanges, you would not be able to make a telephone telephone call from your house, use online banking, buy something through a procurement site, watch Netflix, or use a mobile phone. You wouldn't think necessarily that OpenReach would be core to a mobile phone, but the majority of macro sites, which are the masts, are fed by OpenReach fixed fiber connections. Um, our super fast portfolio. So this is what we would call our FTTC or VDSL. And this is the product that gets you the 40 to 80 megabit speeds, um, a fair bit more than your 0 0.9 or your 0.28 mark. So some good, so our, what we call super fast. So that's 14, 80 meg, and that's delivered by our FTTC. That's the, what's fundamental to the FTTC delivery outside of the exchanges is what we call the PCP but that, what does that really stand for? The green cabinet that's at the end of your road. So um, you, you'll probably know where that is if you, from where your house is and in amongst the industrial estates, you'll see these two. Um, so how does FTTC work? Well, effectively there's a copper connection that goes from that green cabinet to your house via the un, under the ground or via a telegraph pole. And that green cabinet connects by fiber to um, the exchange, hence fibre to the cabinet, and then your last mile, if you wish, over a piece of copper. And that gives you 40, 80 meg speeds. There's another product called GFAST, which is available in some parts of um, in North Sussex. Um, and that gives you speeds up to 330. And as you can see, that's just basically a booster that fits on the side of the green cabinet. FTTP, well, that is exactly what it is, fibre to the premise. Um, the green cabinets are effectively replaced by splitter nodes underground. Um, and what does a splitter node look like? It basically looks like an old CD rack. And effectively, this delivers fiber to your business without the need for copper in the network at all. And if you buy a lease line today, so we call that an ethernet connection, wholesale ethernet, many different words for the same thing. Um, that's delivered pretty similar, although there's no aggregation in this. This delivers you a dedicated fiber going from site A to site B, um, so there's no aggregation and no contention, which of course you do get on the FTTP or FTTC products based on your carriers network. Cool. So hopefully that gives you a kind of a, a simple view of it. Obviously you'll get this slide and if you've got any other questions then please ask us. Um, so, um, so I think the first time I ever met you, Matt, back in July or August last year, you come in and presented about um, the upcoming changes that are happening in the world and in the UK with fiber and FTTP. There are obviously some massive changes and some of our sort of participants have alluded to that. So can you just give us a bit more insight into what's happening there and how that's going to affect SME businesses, large businesses moving forward? Yeah, sure. So whatever OpenReach are doing, 
everything open reach are doing is all with regard to driving ftTP so fiber to the premise to as many premises as possible and there's a lot of enablers for that um, so the first of those is that we're removing as much copper from our network as we can and across various different parts of the country we are removing copper altogether as of today there are 220 exchange areas so remember the towns villages cities that we serve will only be selling FTTP from 12 months of announcement. And that number is going to continue to grow quarter on quarter. There isn't actually anywhere local to us that's that's called out in that area just yet, thankfully. Um, but it won't be too long before that happens. Um, we, the first deadline for that is in June. So if, if you were providing services all over the nationally across the UK, this becomes uh, an ever increasing conundrum about what to do. Where this cannot happen, um, so the other areas, um, we are removing all the copper between the exchange and green cabinets, um, changing the way that tele traditional telephone lines are bought forever. So this results in the removal of what we call the PSDN network. And as you guys mentioned earlier, that happens in 2025. Um, like I mentioned, we need to deliver FTTP as much as we, in huge volumes, as quickly as we can. And we're currently doing that at 42,000 premises a week. So we're not connecting 42,000 premises, people aren't using it that volume. What um, is actually happening is that we're enabling it so that an order can be placed by one of our customers to enable your house or business to buy our FTTP product. And we now have FTTP available to buy in 4.1 million premises across the UK. It went up by 100,000 from me starting this slide deck to finishing it um, with an aim of getting to 20 million by the mid to late 2020s. And of course, if we can go beyond that, we will. Um, like I mentioned, there's two billion pounds worth of investment this year, and I think two billion pounds worth of investment next year, and we need to do more next year. Hot off the press from our financial results, in um, our Q3, we made FTTP available to 550,000 premises across the UK, which is the most we've ever done, um, which means we're enabling a premise every 15 seconds. And people actually buying it, well, we've got 800,000 customers to date buying FTTP, which is roughly 20% take up of our build. The speeds hey. that these products go at, Terry, um, I think that's the other bit that we, we should really talk about. Um, FTTP is available from 0.5 megabit, which is where it just replaces kind of a voice only line up to a gigabit. So you're going to be able to take fiber to the premise from OpenReach at gigabit speed. Yeah, no, it's. Um... Sounds good. Um, so obviously with everyone on the call, we've seen, you know, the Sussex Gatwick area, what impact is that? Is it, are these changes going to have on the, um, on that area? Um, yeah, so, current, so I've got some drawings, some maps for you later, but we can save, we can leave that one and I can talk, I can talk to that and um, I'll flick a little bit briefly on what's actually in the place in Crawley and Manor or specifically, but currently our coverage in West Sussex is restricted mainly for FTTP to new build housing estates. So um, Wickhurst Green, Kilmwood Vale and Kilmwood Vale in, in Horsham and the newer building estates around Hawley. Um, and of course, uh, we have done a trial in Manor Royal for FTTP2. Um, we expect that in Manor Royal, you'll see further investment as we connect more sites and we potentially expand our commercial and trials in those areas. What this the picture shows you here is the light green is your 40 meg, the darker green is your 330 meg, and your black is up to a gigabit speed. Um, West Sussex hasn't been um, high on our agenda in terms of our initial fiber cities build, um, but hopefully that will change in the sh it shortly. So where are we building um, in volume? So we are building in volume in Brighton. Brighton is part of our fiber cities program. So um, in the next couple of years, you'll see hundreds of thousands of premises across Brighton for those of you um, who have businesses or live there. Um, as we try to connect the majority of the city up to FTTP, uh, if, you, if Hove particularly will get um, inundated with the product. Um, in 2020, OpenReach announced that we're going to do 220 market towns and villages with high penetration of fibre to the premise. And amongst those areas were Horsham, Haywards Heath, East Grinstead, um, Felbridge, Billingshurst, Godalming, all of which are, I guess are in, in reach for us here with, um, with your membership. Um, so we will be targeting at getting 75% of those premises um, in the next couple of years full coverage for coverage so that we can exit those exchanges too. 
Um, so hopefully that starts to see that that map will start turning from green to black. What you're going to then ask me is, well, what's happening with Crawley? Um, so I can't tell you exactly because I don't know. But the rate we're going, it's not going to be too long before Crawley gets on one of our announced areas because obviously there are a lot of premises in Crawley and we need to get there because if Openreach don't, others will. Um, we also have the economic impact of what we're doing. So over the last 24 um, months, um, we have nationally created over 5,000 jobs. And, and there is a good percentage of that which are in Sussex. Um, the first slide here, as I say, is the, is the overall of Sussex. If you want to flick to the next one, Terry, this gives you a view of Crawley, which isn't the greatest of reading, and it gives you the, the total number of premises passed. So we can sell to 384 businesses across um, Crawley and, seven, and 1,100 um, consumer premises. And these are the different areas that, as you can see, it's not the best of picture. I'm not trying to sugarcoat this. Matt, uh, just, um, just going back to, so how do Openreach decide on where, you know, where you would work on the fibre, you know, growing the fibre? What, what's the sort of criteria? How does that happen? So I think a lot of it, a lot of it depends on our network, how our network sits today. So how long has it been in the ground for? What's it look like? How easy is it for us to do it? Also looks around what are the, the, the government required, well, sorry, not the government, the local council What's the way leave situation? How quickly can we do it? Um, what's the cost going to be to us? What number of premises is are there? Where does it fit on our strategy um, as we sp spread this product across the country? Um, there, there'll be some of them, Terry, but I, I mean, eff effectively, it's going to be how can we quickly, how can we do this as quickly as we possibly can? Yeah. And this where you'll see quite a lot of the um the northwest of the uk where you've got your kind of coronation street style housing that's much you know the bang for the bang for buck there is a lot quicker than you know a lot of the a lot of west sussex which is um detached houses yeah okay okay cool so but please don't quote me on that one if you're just saying you know, this is what opens this is kind of my view but um i will get you a kind of a, a statement if you like from open reach as to how we decide but um it it's generally is how quickly can we do it no no it's, it's good i suppose it's just trying to yeah quite any questions that we have from anyone um even like the, the man of oil area you can see there's obviously a bit of a concentration there which is good but um so i suppose i'm in a i'm a small business owner what are the benefits of this new product what what how's my world going to change how my stuff how's it going to improve my staff productivity their well-being their connectivity etc what, what's the difference so okay so i think when we look at what fiber to the premise is and the the, the 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 vast change from where we've been my ceo was talking um a chap called clive selly at a customer event not too long ago and he described the impact if we were able to fiber up the whole of the uk in the next five the impact on the gdp Five years, but the impact on the GDP would be circa fifty-nine million billion pounds, um, and I think we're in this kind of weird pandemic at the moment. Never has the UK kind of needed a boost more than today. So you know we've we've got these big targets, but those targets will grow, um, and we see this. That I know this kind of grandstands a little bit, but you know Clive said that in the nineteenth century the kind of equivalent would be the the launch of the railways and the 20th century terry would be your airports mm -hmm. um and so we believe what the country now needs is world-class well-beaten digital infrastructure which we're well on the way to start we're well on, well beyond the start of our journey um the build will generate a big boost for the economy and we believe that the smes in sussex will be will see ftp giving a great leveling up effect you know, no longer is it necessary for employees, employees to migrate to the cities to pursue careers and get their best jobs. Because in a fiber enabled UK, your employers are going to be able to work remotely from home or your offices just as effectively as a big corporate office in London. I think you've also got things like IoT, so Internet of Things. So, I mean, I don't quite know how you, you know, some of you guys may be looking at this already, but with fibers as a premise, the speed that you're going to be able to have and therefore the Wi-Fi ability that that's going to generate will certainly be able to change the way that you do business so 
I think IoT is a good one for that. And I mean, uh, sorry, I forget, forget, forget your name, maybe was it Dave? In the water industry, I imagine there's certain things that you're going to be able to do that you wouldn't have been able to do because of the speeds of broadband in measuring, you know, where you've got your water supplies and when you need to top up based on, rather than relying on someone to remind you, there's, there's certain things that you're gonna be able to use using connectivity, which potentially do that for you. I mean, farming is gonna train drastically in this, in this county as IoT starts to plan its own, in its own strategy and its own future. Of course, there are other major benefits of fiber and that revolves around the volume of faults that, that will not occur on the network. Today, um, and especially, I'm, I'd be surprised if nobody has felt the problems, but with the consistent yeah. rain we've had down here over the last month, um, month or so, our fault rate goes through the roof. Um, what happens on copper is when it rains, copper doesn't like rain and it stops working or your line becomes intermittent or your broadband falls off on fiber to the premise. Obviously that's fibers not affected by water or condensation in the same way. So ask that, you know, so the, stat, the, the network that OpenReach have stands up a lot better than it does on the traditional copper network that we have. And of course, super ultra fast speeds of up to gigabit over an FTTP. Okay, cool. Okay, so literally last question for me. Um, obviously we've got some of, our, some of the Gatwick members on the call today, but obviously some will be able to watch the recording if they want to, but what advice would you be giving um, business owners um, moving forward with these you know, upcoming changes? So everyone across the UK, consumer or business, is going to be affected by what we're doing over the next five years. And you've seen from the presentation that, that and the chat that I've given you today that the portfolio we provide today is going to be very different tomorrow. And it's not guaranteed that you're going to be able to take the, the, taking the FTTP premium that obviously I spent most of today talking about is necessarily the best product for you today. So if you have a lease line into your premise today, it's not necessarily going to replace that because that may be the best thing for you. But if you're asking for my advice, Terry, it will be able to build a relationship with a trusted partner who will spend time explaining the connectivity options um, that are available now and in the future so that you can enable your business to grow in line with your expectations and technology at the heart of that. This will ensure that when change does happen, you're in pole position to take advantage of it for you and your business. So what do I mean by that is that what OpenReach are doing, and, and let's take Crawley, for example. So we've not announced anything in Crawley, but we could, uh, we could announce in April that we're stopping selling copper services in Crawley in um, April 22. And if you're not working with somebody or you're not aware of, aware of this and what, what's going to happen, it could be the fact that you're, you, you go to move offices and you've got to take a different product and that product could be more expensive. So speaking with someone who understands what's happening with OpenReach and where things are going is on the ball with what, what we're doing so that they can sell you the best services, I think is where I would say that's worth it. Yeah, and I suppose I suppose the risk for that is is not being prepared, and obviously cost and, and the implication there is is obviously something that it could be damaging. Um, so, yeah, I mean the price of telco is marginally. You know, today you could buy a DSL connection for what, twelve, fourteen, fifteen pounds, depending on who you buy it from, right? But tomorrow you're going to be buying fibre to premise circuit, and we wholesale that product at around those prices. So, obviously, once you've got a solution to put over it and someone wholesales it onto you, the price of point for fiber is going to be more expensive than you're paying for copper today. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so that's kind of our, our update really. Uh, and thanks, Matt. That was really, that was great. And I've found that, you know, even though the last few months I've been catching up, you know, for me being relatively new to the industry, it's, uh, it's obviously big changes ahead. And um, I think more and more, businesses need to be aware of what's happening um, and that's obviously why this session was great that we could share that with our um with the Gatwick Diamond group um so I suppose let me just I can't see any questions uh, let me just minimize my screen but is there any questions uh, that anyone would like to ask Nick do you want to ask, ask your question that you've typed in I don't think Terry can see it Are you okay to, yeah. to ask it uh, yeah, hi, uh, Terry. I, I was just interested, I'm always seeing how the advancements in communications are going in the UK, 
I always sort of wonder how it compares with the rest of the world and particularly our neighbours in Europe, France, Germany. Are we more advanced than them uh, over the next five years? Are we going to be catching up from them, uh, it's, catching up to them, be way in advance of them? Or what's the situation worldwide? So I, um, I was on a, I was actually on a really interesting session hosted by OpenReach last week. And um, Matt, you probably have a clearer data on this, but I, I was, we are actually behind the some of Europe. Um, and I think the reason for that is the density of the population. I think if you look at somewhere like Spain, it's obviously the cities are high, high populated and the density in cities like Madrid, Barcelona, et cetera, you can see that when you, when you visit these places. But obviously that's the, the, the objective for, for open reach in the UK. And obviously it even being in Boris Johnson's manifest um, last year, uh, well, two years ago, you know, around connectivity uh, being a priority. Um, but Matt, I don't know if you've got anything else you want to add. Well, I, I mean, Terry, you, you said it there. I mean, the UK is very different to the other city, the other countries across Europe and the wider world. Our investment strategy in the 2010s was to get fibre to the cabinet um, to as many people as possible, which obviously for OpenReach to do was cheaper than deploying fibre to the premise because we didn't have to dig up the roads to do as much of that as possible. Um, so it enabled us to get faster speeds from the DSL speeds, so your, your eight megs up to 80 meg. Um, so we made down that strategy. Now we're on the fiber to the premise strategy and let's be honest, we started from a position which wasn't fabulous, but the rate we're going, you know, I think we will catch up. Um, and as I say, by 2025, OpenReach will have got to 20 million premises, but OpenReach aren't the only people who are building. So you've also got companies like Virgin Media and City Fiber, you may have heard of, who are also deploying services around the UK in, in, in different volumes. So yeah, there's there's a lot of activity in the UK, the government are helping. I think we need to go, the government to go a little further, but we're all working as, as an industry to get fiber to the premise to as many people as possible. Okay. I think what, I think coming in again into this sector, what and obviously what coronavirus and the pandemic has highlighted is connectivity is vital to the infrastructure and to the, the, the economy. And obviously with more and more people now working from home, um, connectivity is key. You know, if you, I've been on calls um, with customers or on webinars where people's broadband or their Zooms are freezing, et cetera. It's, it, and, you know, and people are sitting there, I was on one yesterday and someone was like, oh, wait, this always happens. And it's like, you know, people are just a, a lot more aware of it. And it's this this mm -hmm. topic is, you know, really important to be sharing with, like I say, with businesses, but also residential customers, you know, people at home, you know, have you got four devices that are being used at the same time? I've got two children that, you know, get on an iPad or a tablet. And at the same time that I'm logging on, my wife's on her laptop you know it is really important that connectivity now is, is is decent and people are more aware of it you know you speak to your friends and whatnot they know what download speeds they're getting um whereas probably two three years ago they wouldn't know if it works it works it's brilliant but you know now it's it's really front of mind i think that's that's the change thank you um i have a question um what is the, what do you see the, the sort of medium to long term impact of 5G being on cabled networks in terms of, you know, fiber and copper and stuff, because it's obviously got quite a high bandwidth and it doesn't really matter necessarily how many devices, but apart from the fact that the towers transmit coronavirus, of course, but um, <laughs> <laughs> don't go there, Francis. <laughs> just teasing. Just teasing. But, um, <laughs> Yeah, what do you see the long-term impact of 5G being? Because in, in my world, having looked at the kind of spec of it and already the kind of internal use in, in space, big internal inside spaces like warehouses for communication with devices and stuff like that, and it, what's the, the broader picture with that? Because I would have thought that would have a, a big dent in, in hard, sort of the need to hard cable stuff. I think there's going to be a lot of convergence between the two products. And I think a lot of people said a lot about 4G being the same. Um, I think as a group, BT have obviously own EE as well as um, OpenReach and EE will be rolling out their network for 5G as quickly as they can too. Um, I think it will be an alternative and you've seen that um, three 
have have productized a fixed line 5G product. Um, I think we stand as open reach behind what we've done over the, the decades and that a landline will work. A landline effectively connects directly into your computer rather than being mobile led. Um, but I think the future will tell us. I, I mean, I think you can go out and read various different articles on, on, on all of this and depends on the speed you get, what, what the Wi-Fi is gonna look like to travel around your premise, I mean, your house or your office. But I do think, I think the, everybody will have a converged, eventually will be having a converged view of both and devices that your, your buy will be a converged both, both versions. So you don't, you won't necessarily know you're dropping off your 5G and joining your Wi-Fi as such. I guess like you well, do I mean, on your iPhone today, right? It's already a little bit like that today, you know, I, yeah. I can be on, on the phone or yeah. playing a, you know, some mm. music on Spotify as I walk into my house, the Wi-Fi cuts over from the from the outside 4G. Mm. But I just think that obviously 5G with the, the speeds that they're talking about is is going to be a, a bit of a game changer. And I just see that being really competitive with what you're doing in terms of hard, hard mm. networks. I, yeah. Sorry, Paul. Uh, yeah, I say, I think 5G, I say the... One of the things with 5G, obviously, the, the, the number of masks needed compared to 4G are, you know, it's a much num the masks need to be closer together on 5G than they are on 4G, because you say, although it, uh, like everything, as, as these things all run faster, they, they run faster, but only over a shorter distance. Um, so there's a, there's going to be a need for a larger number of 5G cells. And obviously, the, the, the mobile providers will be you know, where, where a mobile provider is doing a fair converged solution, they're, they're going to be managing their sort of backhaul requirements so that, you know, they get the right mix between the fixed world and the and the mobile world. And they won't, you know, I mean, and I remember the original 3, 3G stuff came in and people started offering off wife, you know, the, the dongles that were around 15 years ago because the, the backhaul providers had loads of spare capacity in their network. They sold all the dongles, they ran out of network. And then, you know, then it was cost. You know, they they've gone from utilizing something that you know that they'd already paid for to to needing to expand their network, and you know, that it didn't become quite as easy. So I think it'll be definitely be a balance between the two. I think most of the mobile operators w are also looking at fixed solutions as well. So it'll be it'll be, it'll be more converged, and five G will likely end up being. Uh, a solution in not spots, you know, so there will be places where, you know, getting fiber somewhere, getting fiber to an entire area is difficult, but you, know, you can cover a number of premises with, you know, with a 4G or a 5G mask uh, in, a, in a rural areas to, to fill in the gaps. So, you know, it'll be a complementary solution as well as, you know, giving a converged solution in the more urban areas. Okay. Oh, thank you. So uh, I was interested I'm in that. Just a, a follow up question. That, and that whole area of alternatives to getting our bound, bandwidth. Um, what's Openreach's view about what Elon Musk is doing? You know, I've seen his announcement about SpaceX and uh, also his announcement about um, how many this year alone, I can't remember the number, but he's firing loads and loads of satellites up there right now. Yeah, Starlink. Worldwide, you're talking, you're talking world, Starling. worldwide uh, uh, internet access via satellites. I just wondered how you, how you saw that, Matt. You mean, um, you mean the Starlink, Starlink network, right? The, sorry? The, it's called Starlink, the Starlink network. Uh, um, yeah, I, don't, I don't know, I, don't, I can't remember yeah. the brand, but just the fact that he, he's, he's getting it into that satellite internet access market. Aside, aside from the technical abilities of Starlink, um, I have some fundamental objections to it on the basis of cluttering up space with a whole bunch of junk. Thousands and thousands of satellites is not really a good idea. We've already ruined the planet on, on the ground and in the oceans. Now we're just ruining the space above us as well. So whatever the benefits are, I'm not sure they're worth it. Yeah. Um, well, there are, there are multiple satellite providers today providing broadband. A lot of what you receive when you're on the aeroplanes and cruise ships and the like, I know is delivered by those guys. Um, it's another another connectivity option for the market. It means that open reach have got to be punchier, better, make sure our deliveries happen on time, make sure that our speeds are fast and that our customer service is excellent. I think, the, I mean, I don't know our overall position um, on it, Mark, but I'd say that any any competition is good because it makes, makes us sharper, it makes us better at what we do and therefore deliver you guys a better product.
and, and with Virgin Media, um, what degree is it that you know, if you're in first with um, putting in the fibre to premises, does that mean then that Virgin Media can't provide fibre to the premises, or can you no. both be made right available? Yeah, there are going to be places across the UK which have got three or four different providers of fibre to the premise to your to a premise. There's no, there's no. The only area in UK I think where there's only one provider. Of, well, Openreach don't operate as in um, Hull, and yeah. Uh, obviously you've got Kingston there who've got fibre to the premise everywhere, but uh, you know, Openreach don't don't sell services there. Um, I think you can buy our network there, but we don't sell services as such. So, I think you will find in Crawley that. You'll have Openreach, you'll have you'll have Virgin Media, and then potentially some of the other alternative network providers there too. I mean, what you what you can find um, in in pockets of new build is actually the the builders coming to their own agreement with with some of the altnets, and actually Openreach aren't even available in some new build estates because the builders have given first mover advantage to one of the the sort of the third party networks that are out there. Um, obviously, although we have an obligation, you know, to to provide services where we're allowed to, if the builders and the and the people in charge of the land choose to not let us in, then you know we just you know we 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 can't serve. So you know there may be some new estates out there where open reach isn't even an option, and that's because the um, you know the developers have chosen not to allow us in. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Were you going to mention? Sorry, Matt. Were you going to? No, I'm. I'm yeah, no. I've pretty much Paul covered it there, mate. So that's fine. <laughs> yeah. Can I ask that? Obviously, I appreciate BT Overreach are there to make money, um, but I think you have a target of hitting seventy-five percent, uh, but providing uh, FTTP to seventy-five percent of premises within each exchange's footprint. Yeah. And. Um, the concern I have on behalf of businesses is, is in, obviously in order for you to make a quicker return on, on investment, you know, I think you're going to be prioritising residential as opposed to business. And the concern I have is that where does that leave business, b- businesses? Because if you're just hitting 75%, a lot of businesses are still not going to be able to access this faster connectivity. So I'd be interested you and Paul in terms of yeah. your... So Mark, so Mark, it's a really good point. And if I'm honest, today our indexing of business over consumer is probably under where it should be. Um, but by no means is, uh, do we miss out business as an area. Um, the portfolio we'll be rolling out, we're, aware, we're fully aware that it's going to be required everywhere because of the speeds it can get to. So it's a bit different to our other portfolio where it, it wasn't as attractive to a to an SME upwards, but as part of our rollouts, businesses are not going to be excluded. Um, today, it's been we've done what we can do where it's been relatively easy for us to do it, um, which in some parts of the UK is over indexing on business, but some parts of the UK under indexes. But th- that really has been on our scale build to date. But we are not going to be missing out businesses um, for this. Of course, in the corporate spaces of the UK, it will be difficult for us to do that because yeah. we've we've got to get a way leave to dig, um, and that's not yes. necessarily going to be yeah. Um, yeah. easy. <laughs> and we know how long um, that can take. <laughs> but yeah. you know, for for although our coverage in Crawley has been not fabulous to date, we do have fibre to the premise available in Manor Royal for a good chunk of it. Um, and more will be enabled as as we do. So it was one of our first trial sites for fibre to the premises in the business park. What we're doing is a pro- in the product as well is today you buy fibre to the premise from me and you buy a effectively you're just buying a connection. And to date we've really only got care levels. Um, what do I mean by care level? Sorry, today we've only got like the the SLA the the fixed levels that have been signed for consumers. And we do have like quicker fixes, but everything's been designed around a consumer product rather than a business product. So what you'll see over the next 12 to 18 months is Openreach launching a business focused fiber to the premise product, which will have, you know, a, you know, a business based SLAs 
um, insta business based installation. So it much more focused on what you guys would want from the product rather than just having a hybrid of a consumer product. Thank you. So in summary, business is not going to be forgotten and there will be areas which over and will be areas which under index. Um, but we are looking at a portfolio focused at businesses. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Okay. Just is there any one last question? Just conscious of time. No, can Come I just ask a quick question? Um, sure. Sort of going back to what you were saying about the importance of connectivity at the moment and seeing the map and being quite disappointed that Crawley seems quite well behind. And I'm sure there are other areas. Is there anything that businesses can do to influence how quickly they receive the new, the new technology? So every business can register interest on our website um, that for FTTP, so you can go and register it. If um, we also, there's various different vouchers. I mean, I could go on a while, Sally, but the, there are um, the voucher schemes and the like that you may well have heard of where businesses can club together in the same area of, you know, if you've got one of the, the, the industrial areas of Crawley where it's not covered today, businesses could club together and club together vouchers and approach OpenReach and say, will you bring FTTP here? Things like that could happen. Um, and, um, you know, one of the telcos, if, you know, one of the, the our, our customers can, can help you on the journey of things like that. Um, don't be wrong, every city and town in the UK is important to open reach. And the reason why Crawley hasn't been done to date isn't because we're not going to do it. And Crawley is one of the bigger towns in the in the country. So I can't imagine it's going to be long before we start, start with our diggers um, and start causing it traffic hell. <laughs> As we, as, we, <laughs> as, as we get to deploying the product, Sally. But yeah, so effectively two things. One is register interest on our website for Fiber to the Premise. And obviously the more interest we get, the more likely it's to happen. Um, but secondly, it's there are voucher schemes that the government put out there, which if clubbed together can fund um, Fiber to the Premise deployment. Thank you. And there's no influence or involvement through local our local authority or anything like that. It is, it's um, directly between well, company and businesses that are interested is it so well the local authority are already lobbying us okay um through our various um so we have reps that work with every local authority in the uk and we will be working with the local authority on when we could do this and how we could make it easier for us to do it um you know one of the biggest challenges is digging the roads up to, mm. to deploy this because if we're having to dig new duck to push fiber through there is no other way of us doing it um or putting telegraph poles up, for example, is the other alternative. But again, to do that, we need to have easier access to be able to do it. Um, so those conversations are onward going, and I'd say that, that that should be happening. So if you do have contacts within that area and it's not, please push them at me and I'll get make sure that the, the people on the ground are speaking to them. Cool. Is there a um, great question, by the way, so I don't have a really good question. Is there anything that um, GDB itself do uh, by way of lobbying and uh, the equivalent of one one massive voucher for the whole of the Gatwick Diamond? Um, so the way in which, I mean, if I'm honest with you, Jeff, the way in which that we'll deploy the fibre, it's expensive, right? So the way in which you can club the vouchers together only works if you've got them all in the same location. So, and Manor Oil's already in our deployment um, we've already deployed and I imagine will extend when we can. Um, so, for example, if you're in one of the er other areas of Crawley where you've got multiple partners, yes, Gatwick Diamond through your membership could do that and you could take a role in leading to get people to sign up to it. But it's only going to work if you've got all the premises which are next to each other, because that's the way you get the money to spread further, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Effect effectively, it would be all of the various business centres within the diamond well you know yeah. you mentioned Brighton earlier but yeah Crawley has been mentioned a lot but there are, are other centres within the diamond yeah. as well. So, yeah. so Brighton itself I mentioned earlier is one of our five cities we're rolling out five to premise across all of that now yeah. and um, over the coming 18 next 18 months so if, if you go in our checkers and whatnot you're going to see a lot of um, my black dots rather than the yellow the green dots the government are also putting money into Brighton um, through one of the big projects that's out there at the moment so 
be it if it's not open reach it will be another provider will be providing more and more fiber into um, brighton the currently deployments from other alt net providers in worthing um which where open reach have have a have a bit but if you've got members down there they're going to be able to buy services from the likes of city fiber who've deployed there um so there's there's a, there's a lot going. So say it's not just us, but there's a lot going on. But will it help? Think, well, yeah, I'm not sure. So I was just going to interject and say, um, also we've you know obviously what us at Structured Communications we work very closely with Matt and the team, and we get regular updates of exchange chain uh, closures. So if there was anything that was going to affect anyone within the Gatwick Diamonds, uh, we I would you know myself and Matt um, would share that information, um, and that's a big part of our our strategy here actually is that, you know we're regularly getting that information so we are obviously contacting any affected um, areas that we work with so you know we I, I think we you know we're trying to be a lot more active with the Gatwick Diamond um, myself I'm trying you know I'm on a lot more of these sessions and um, I'll be hopefully when we can meet face to face soon you know you'll be seeing a lot more of me and Matt and the team so we'll be able to share that information and if you've got any questions obviously just drop myself a note um, or um, or Matt Dexter from OpenReach. So I keep saying Matt Dexter and Matt. <laughs> <laughs> but um, if you've got yeah any further queries, just obviously drop us a line, and we'll be happy to help and answer your questions. But I think that's 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 it. That's time. It's an hour. So that kind of flew by. Well, that was really good. Um, so thanks to Matt and um, Paul from OpenReach for that. It was a really insightful session. Um, and thanks Sally for letting us uh, host it. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your support. We'll get the recording up on the GDP website and send out a delegate list for you, for you shortly. So thanks very much for today. And thank you Great. for your time, everybody. Thank, thank you very you. much. Good to see everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye.